Oh, no, that's okay. Are we on air? Oh, are we? Good. I didn't mean to wake you up. Well, I kind of (laughs) did. Are you with me, Larry? Yes, I am. Oh, okay. Okay. This this new mixer is a little different than the old mixer. Oh, is it? it? Yeah. Oh. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, oh, I can hear I can an echo. Hear I can't echo. stand I can't to hear my own hear voice. Her. Maybe it's gone Maybe now. It's gone now. Nope, nope, I can still hear it. All right. I'm hey, still that's better. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I just can't stand my voice. Ugh. I never even listen if I've been on the air or whatever. I just can't even stand to listen to it. So, yeah, well, either. so what's... What do you, you have any updates for us? That sure was sad last night about what was going on in New York, huh? Yeah, um, not really. I mean, they're, they're uh, trying to say it wasn't terrorism, and then I'm seeing mm-hmm. ISIS claims responsibility for it. Of course. And um, we had a mall shooting yesterday also. Oh, boy. And um, an electrical uh, thing exploded inside a mall in Virginia. Gosh, so, uh, that anger, you know, is just, I just pray that the Lord intervene within everyone, their hearts, and rid them of this anger that's within them. Because, you know, why, I guess I don't really understand the ins and outs. Why are they, why do they always try to cover it up? Like, you know, it's, I think it's just best to hit, you know, be honest and just hit it full force in the truth. You know, like if it is the source of it, we know the source is spiritual, but it's manifesting in the natural now more than ever. And so, you know, why cover it up? Let's just say what it is. You know, they're claiming that they did it. And, you know, why this covering all the time? I I just don't really get that. Like, what is that? You know, we need to go to the throne. We need to ask the Father. Like, what is this that prompts us to cover up the truth? Whether the truth, and I don't mean the truth as in Jesus. I mean the truth, you know. If it was something evil that occurred, okay, it did. You know, let's talk about it. Let's move on. You know, let's get it out there in the open. It happened. Okay. But what is this? I mean, why do they are they so compelled to come on and say, "Oh no, it wasn't this and it wasn't that"? When Larry, hold on. Yeah, I, I don't know what. <laughs> All right, now I got you good. It went crazy for a minute. Oh, did it? So? Yeah. Well, see, <laughs> the <laughs> darkness doesn't like the truth out, even if it's the revealing of their <laughs> plots and plans. They, I think they like this hidden thing, this <laughs> whatever it is. Really yeah, absolutely. Mm. You should be back okay. All right. It's, uh, it's, there's just the delay in the chat room. Yeah. Yes, amen. I, I don't know. I, they, they never, um, never do. They always, you know, they're, no initial indica- uh, indication of terror. Yeah. It's the same old, same old every time. Well, and if when, you just didn't put a label on it, okay, so we could accept the fact that it was terror and at the hands of man. And we can not label it because we, being more spiritually mature, understand that it's a dark force at work to create terror. So, you know, not worrying about labeling like a collective group who did it, but it was to instill fear. Obviously that's what it is. Well, in the mall one, the dude was saying Al Akbar, so. Let's say, oh, really? Mm. Hmm. So I took a drink of coffee. Yeah, it's just, um, it's strange, everything that's going on, although it is allowed. 
And um, I don't know what you all want to talk about today. So you can kind of tell me in chat because I can talk about um, false Christ and false prophets. I could talk about the taming of the tongue and witchcraft because the tongue's very crafty. And so I can talk about that. I could um, talk about be therefore perfect, even as your father, which is in heaven is perfect because that word perfect does not mean what man's definition of perfect is. And so um, I could teach about what godly perfection is because it's actually at enmity with man's definition. So, um, you know, we can talk about several different things or we can tie them all in together. We can uh, Liz said, tell us what's going on in the world that we need to know about news. Well, um, the earth shaking. <laughs> and we can get so caught up in those little details. You know, we get caught up in the details and um, have a tendency to go off on little rabbit trails. And even that is the device of the enemy that the enemy wants to do anything and everything to take our eyes off the prize. And that's Jesus. And so we're not to run to and fro, you know, that's why I like it, Larry, when you deliver the news, because you you deliver it, you, you stand, you know, you're standing in the truth. And you're not movable. You're just delivering the news. Unmovable. Because you don't let it shake you. You know, you're not saying, oh, this happened today. You know, you don't put the force of excitement behind what is happening. You're just laying it out there so people are aware of what's going on. Right. Because if we really are in the right placement with the Lord, we're walking according to the calling he's placed upon our lives. And if it, I just rely on you to tell me what I need to know. I'm like, what do I need to know? Just tell me. Because if we're really working for the kingdom, then we're so busy working, being his hands and feet and spreading his love forth into the world that we really don't even have time unless we're appointed by him to do such things we don't even have time to be focusing on the world events. And um, so that's what you're appointed to do. I mean, I know that and you know that, so you're walking it out. But the, it's nice to have a place to go to. You can just kind of tell us what we need to know. And um, Thank you. Yeah. No, well, thank you for your service. Just don't ask for a raise. <laughs> <laughs> I tell Larry that because he doesn't get paid. <laughs> so, no. <laughs> so we do live in this time right now. You know, we were born for such a time as this. And um, the word the Lord gave me yesterday is that our humility is being forged. And so with everything that's going on, who's going to remain humble? You know, who's going to stay in that place of humility? When we come boldly before the throne of grace and we pray, that word boldly in Greek actually means in humility. And I know, there we go again, man thinks, well, I'm just going to go to the throne and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pray for, you know, blessing, that name it and claim it. <laughs> A lot of people used to do that all the time, that name it and claim it is mine. I'm going boldly to the throne. Well, that's not even actually what it means. And um, Kimmy's saying, let's talk about how to prepare spiritually for what's ahead. How can our prayers be more effective? How can we pray more effective? Well, I think I just kind of answered that question is um, we, we when we go to the throne in prayer, number one, we have to be clean. We have to, we have to first, um, she said, blab it and grab it. We, we 
that's why he's forging our humility to come to him in humility. So, you know, a good way to go to him in prayer would be first, Lord, you know, show me anything that I'm doing that is not in line with your will in my life personally and my relationships with others, you know, show me anything that I've done that may be of offense to you and um, help me to reflect your love to others. Forgive me, Lord, for those things that I do that I know not, that are not pleasing in your sight. Lord, you know, I ask that you would, yes, like Kimmy said, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And I thank you that you're doing that, Lord. You know, we also offer him praise and thanksgiving for what he is doing. When we pray the same prayer over and over and over, sometimes he's pressing upon our spirit to start thanking him because he's already released it and he's already at work. And maybe we don't even see his hand in it, but we can thank him that he is doing the work right now. And just because it hasn't manifested in the natural yet, doesn't mean that it isn't actually performing. He watches over his word to perform it. And just because we can't see it doesn't mean that he's not at work because he is. So that's another thing that we can do in prayer is we can come to him and say, thank you, Lord. Lord, I asked you for the salvation of my family. And although I'm not seeing that, manifesting right now in the natural, I thank you that that is happening. And calling forth, there's a scripture that says that we need to call forth those things that aren't as though they are. And so we can start thanking him for the work that he's doing. And just because we can't see it doesn't mean he isn't doing a work. The chances are he's going to do the work in us first because we have asked for And so he's forging us right now so that we're better able to stand in authority. And when we stand in his authority, then we change the atmosphere that's around us. And the enemy, when we resist him, he must flee. I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but sometimes you can walk into a room or you can walk into a chat. And those that are in opposition to you or they have um, some sense of contention with you, they will flee. Because they don't want to be in your presence. And it may, it's, may not be anything that you're doing. It's that they have opposition within themselves. And if you're standing in that godly authority and always standing in love, then they will just flee. You don't even have to do or say anything, and they, they'll just leave. They can't stand the presence of him inside you. And so, I don't know. What do you think, Larry? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You can tell when you, you, you walk into a room, the presence. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, we're those lights. We're called to be the light, the salt mm-hmm. and the light of the earth. I and had a laugh when Michael first talked about oil in your lamps and everything. Uh-huh. I ran out to Walmart and got lamps and oil. And <laughs> oh, did you? Oh, yeah. in that something? Yeah. <laughs> but that wasn't really what he was talking about. Well, you know, the thing about it, Larry, <laughs> is yes and yes. Yeah. Because I know you, and I know that you would share yourself. Being the oil that's inside of you, you will share that right now. And you also, if someone was in need, you would share the lamp and the oil with other people. So it's yes and yes. Amen. Yeah. So <laughs> as we prepare, since you brought it up, as we prepare ourselves spiritually to stand before the Son of God, then we're also standing in the natural to stand before him because this when he appears this time he's coming in the clouds every eye will see him so although we can see him now many cannot but all will all eyes will see him every knee shall bow before him 
And so those that cannot see him spiritually, they are not connected to him. Boy, they will that day, won't they? Because he's coming in the clouds. Amen. Yeah. So, you know, like Liz said, you may need it or someone else may need it. And I often think that if my house, if I somehow the Lord calls me to abandon my house, then the few things that I do have, I I just pray that the Lord will lead people here to gather. I don't really have very much. I have some water and um, a few odds and ends, but I guess I just don't even think on that very much. I don't I don't know why. It's just not something that He's called me to do, but that doesn't mean that other people are not purposed to do that because they'll be a Goshen. A Goshen is a place of um, that the Lord would send people to in the Old Testament to be refreshed, and there would be water there and food there and tent there, and um, it would just be like a watering hole. And so a storehouse would be another way. So some of you are that Goshen. Some of you, the Lord has laid upon your heart to get medical supplies and to have Bibles and water and food. And that is something that the Lord has led you to do. And so because of that, then your dwelling could become a Goshen for those who are needs. And so don't conform to me, conform to Christ, conform to Jesus. Whatever he's telling you to do, do it. Absolutely. Why does your dog bark when I start talking always? Well, we had it muted before. Um, he just barks randomly for no reason. See, being obedient. <laughs> There were a couple times when Hello. I would be on air with Effie, and there at the end when I was on air with this, it seemed like that rooster would start crowing. It was so funny. I would laugh so hard. It, it was almost <laughs> like clockwork. The rooster would start crowing. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, is that a warning? You know, Peter got that warning. Now here comes yeah. Gracie. She's wetting up on my lap, wagging her little tail. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> See, even dogs can be demanding. There's lots of distractions right? going on right now. So, um, well, I think we're going to talk about the elect because that's the highest calling. That's where the Lord's kind of got us right now as he's forging us to, to be the elect. And, um, you know, it talks about in, um, let me go back. We, in first Thessalonians five, three, it talks about for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. So in this particular scripture, it's talking to those that, who are asleep and not watching. They're not sober. Children of darkness. To them, he comes as a thief. But that's not what he has appointed us to be. He doesn't appoint us to be asleep. He appoints us to be awake, to be sober, to be vigilant, to be watching all the time. And there was a time a while back that I really felt like I needed more clarity and understanding because there was a longing inside of me to not be deceived. I did not want to be deceived. And in Matthew 24, it says in verse 22, it is not possible to deceive the very elect. That's not the elect. It's the very elect. And that is an affirmative. When it says very, it's an affirmative word. And it says actually that the days are shortened for the sake of the elect. 
And so am I trusting him or am I trusting self? Because if I rely on my own understanding, then I will be deceived. I have been deceived and quite possibly will be deceived again. But if I rely on him, then I cannot be deceived. It's not even possible. So since he warned of false Christ and false prophets coming, and those are two different things too. It's important to note that because in Matthew 24, 24, it talks about there'll be false Christ and false prophets that arise that we're living in that time now, family. That's the time that we're living in at this very moment. The rising of false Christ and false prophets. And like I said, I did a word study and there are two different things. False Christ are actually false saviors. They put themselves in a position to represent the Messiah. And they will also be one who falsely lays claim to the name and the office of the Messiah. They do this to seduce many. That's in Mark 13, 22. If you want to go back and read it, they lie. They're deceitful. They speak deliberate falsehoods. They represent themselves as anointed. You may not recognize them as being anointed, but they will tell the masses that they've been anointed to come and save the lost. They actually will say they're a son of God. They display powers representing gifts of the Holy Spirit, but they're false. They use them to deceive and to seduce. And you may ask yourself, well, how would they even do this? And um, they do not glorify God and Jesus in what they are doing. And I'll kind of tell you what they do is they will come in to help others. They may even act like, oh, I'm protecting you. But they act, they say that they are doing it. They don't say, they don't come in the name of the Lord. You know, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They don't come in his name. And they may imitate God's might, activity, and power. And Towards the end, they'll even go to the extreme and say that they were a part of the creation of the universe. Maybe, maybe punishing in their actions. And chances are they may not be punishing in their words, but they may be punishing in action. One thing is, is um, have you heard of someone that's passive aggressive? Like, okay, so they withhold love. I mean, I've been in relationships before where people will withhold love from me to punish me. So that would be something that would be more of a false love. That's not the purity of the love of Jesus to withhold love. Right. right. And they will make proclamations that determine to control the destiny of men. So, and I think Michael talked about this, not to lord over someone's life. So they might try to be lord in your life. They might try to withhold love to control your destiny. That would not be a good thing. And um, I took all of that out of the Greek, but they actually, it's interesting because it says that they come from a gaping opening or a gulf. So there's an opening there, like we've opened the door to let them in. We're to guard our hearts, but we've kind of let them in maybe to that secret place. And so they have an opening there where they can actually get in and do this. And just so you know, you all, this is important to note that they will replicate or they do replicate the hand of Jesus, which is healing, to furnish what is needed in our lives. And so it says in the word that they will display false signs and wonders. So don't be moved by signs and wonders. Okay. I mean, I've spoken of this before, but really don't be moved by that. Don't be impressed by it is what I mean. It's we're to seek the healer, not the healing. And so we seek Jesus. And if the healing comes, 
glory to his name. If the healing is delayed, glory to his name. It's okay. okay. We, we trust him. Look how long you trusted him for this, and Larry. Look how many years. Amen. And you didn't Once. waver. Mm-hmm. You didn't waver, did you? Not too much. Mm -mm. Well, and what I mean by waver, you didn't turn your back on him. Oh, no, never. No. No, no you didn't turn your back on him. So that's what a false Christ would do. And so the best way to remember this is a false Christ would be a false savior. Anybody or anything you're looking to to rescue you or save you. And trust me, if you're seeking it, you'll find it. Because what we seek, we find. And so if you're seeking this, then you have a little crack in your armor. And you need to seek Jesus first because the enemy is just waiting, waiting to send a false savior into your life. And so a false prophet then, so a Christ would be more actions. We'll just define it that way. A false prophet is more speaking. And I found it real interesting when I was studying this word, that the root word of um, a prophet here, which is a false one, is um, Sayu, and it's P-S-Y-O-O, but I thought immediately of PSYOP. <laughs> like a, a right. PSYOP, isn't that something? So right. this is someone who tries to speak for Jesus, but they do so falsely. So they act the part of a divine prophet. They speak falsehood. They pre pretend to be religious, and they will even be a foreteller. So and I don't want you to think like a fortune teller, like you go pay someone like a fortune teller, although that would be a false prophet as well. But think of it more that someone comes representing themselves as, hey, I got a word for you. I, I The Lord gave me a word for you. And I'm not saying that the spirit can't move in that. What I'm saying is, I mean, because that happens all the time. What I'm saying is, they want to place themselves in your life on the throne of Jesus when really he, a true prophet will always glorify his name. Even the work he's doing in your life through a prophet will be for his glory. Always. It, it just, you're developing, developing a testimony for his glory. It's all about him. And so as he heals us, as um, say you get, like Larry, you got healed. Well, you immediately started to glorify Jesus from the beginning. And so you take your testimony and you'll pass that on to someone else that the Lord sends across your path. And you will tell them, listen, this is what he did for me. He can do it too. Now, Speaking, Absolutely. Yeah, speaking falsely would be like, hey, do what I did, and you will be healed. And then you start to manipulate that person on their walk. That would be false. So um, a false prophet is also an interpreter of hidden things and oracles. So they may say like, well, I have been given the real truth in this. Only I am made aware of something that was hidden. And, you know, we know there's mysteries in the world or in the word and the Lord hides them to confound the wise, but we are to seek out the truth. And we do that through reading the word and teaching one another in the Holy Spirit, but always to glorify the Lord. And so another thing that's important to know is um, that false prophets hover around apostles and disciples, and that's biblical. I didn't just pull that out of the air. So they have a tendency to, because, see, they need to glean from the truth prophets 
to be able to imitate and be false. And so they have a tendency to just associate with them. And like I said, I got that out of the scripture. And so they appear to be as light and they use miracles to deceive. They wear sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're raven- ravenous wolves. And that's Matthew seven fifteen. And so first John tells us to test the spirits and we should be able to do that now do that testing of the spirits because that takes um, spiritual maturity. And so we kind of have been moving that direction. And since Jesus warned us of these false Christ and false prophets coming in second um, or in Matthew 25, two times he actually warned us of that. There's a reason he warned us because he didn't want us to be deceived, you know. And um, there's a lot of, I don't know, there's a lot of danger out there. And sometimes it gets overwhelming. To me, it gets overwhelming that I have to remember, oh, I have to correct myself because Jesus is the author and finisher of everyone's faith. I'm not. And otherwise, if we go around trying to author and finish everyone's faith when we can't even do that to ourselves, it gets really overwhelming. And so, um, you know, he warned us that when they say he is in the desert, don't go. The desert, it would be in the dry place when you feel spiritually drained. That's the desert. Remember that the enemy is going to come in there and try to send someone to rescue you out of it. An imitator. Right. And so we, we just can't fall to that. So how will we know when Jesus appears? It says like lightning that shines from the east to the west. Every eye will see him. That's how we're going to know. We won't know any other way. And I don't know. I just, we almost had a lightning that appeared from the east all the way to the west. It was crazy. Really? Tell me about that. Let me find it here. Mm-hmm. We had lightning that it was the world's longest. Wow. Re- recorded lightning ever. This lightning was recorded 199 miles in length. Oh, my. They're 199 miles in length, roughly the distance between New York City and Washington, D.C. It streaked across the skies of Oklahoma back in 2007. My and goodness. we've had our lightning has increased since then, so who knows? At the same time, they also confirmed another record striking over France in 2012, a lightning bolt that managed to to sustain its connection between the ground and the heavens for a whopping 7.74 seconds. The average duration is only 0.2 seconds. So look at that, 7.74 seconds. My goodness, um, Kimmy's wanting to know where was that at and when. You said 2007? In Oklahoma. In, oh, in Oklahoma. Boy, they get a lot of storms. Bless those souls down yeah. there. They really do. They get so many. Well, it's important to recognize how it is written so that we don't fall for something that is not in the word and and like I said I was just kind of going it through Matthew 24 about how Jesus will come so I don't really want to go there too much but um, Lucis Trust oh, I just despise that but um, they have a whole website dedicated to the Christ they call him the or call it this entity the Christ, 
And since we know that the enemy imitates everything that the Lord does, because he can't come up with anything of his own, he has to imitate. I think that it's important to take note of this, that he may, when this false Christ appears, that he may come in the lightning, but somehow, I don't know how, you know, but he will actually say, I am Christ when he comes. And they call him the Christ. They say, here is the Christ. So we won't believe it. We just won't believe it. And he'll have signs and wonders. So we won't be deceived. And evidently, he'll somehow, they'll, they'll announce him in the desert. And I don't know the ins and outs of that. Maybe someone else has studied it or will study it. But they will say he's in the desert. Maybe he'll, they'll reveal him in the desert. But there's some reason it's both spiritually and naturally, like I said. Everything always is. It happens first in the spiritual, then manifests in the natural. Right. And then it also says, do not believe he is in the secret chambers. So immediately after, and that's immediate, immediately after it says. So I would think it would be in a blink. The sun is darkened. The moon doesn't give her light. The stars fall from heaven. The powers of heaven are shaken. That means the order changes. The order then changes. Heaven comes to earth. Godly order comes to earth. That's what that means when the powers of heaven are shaken. And in the word it says, then, then the sign of the son of man shall appear in heaven. So the the word sign here means a universal occurrence to be made known. So he'll be made known then Jesus will. And it says it appears in the heaven. That's the sky, the region above the clouds where lightning and thunder is produced. It also means a mountain to be moved, to elevate, to carry off, to take from among the living. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn and see Jesus coming in the clouds. So all the earth will mourn, will even mourn. And it says then, so right after, he sends his angels by sounding a trumpet. That's the last trump and the, seventh, the sixth seal, sorry. And the angels gather the elect from the earth and from heaven. I thought that was really interesting. The elect are gathered from both the earth and from heaven. Right. And so. That proves the existence here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I think before I just had this impression, I don't know, and it's just me, you know, when you study the word and then you have to study the same scripture over the course of years and it kind of unfolds. But I always had the impression that the angels would gather the elect from the earth. I don't know why I never noticed that from the heaven before. But I think it's when, you know, it says in the word that we'll be gathered together and meet him in the air and the clouds. Well, they're already there. So he will gather both. But all of them are the elect. And it's really interesting because that's when he starts talking about in verses 40 and 41, how one is taken and one left. You know, there's two in the bed, one taken, one left. Two grinding at the mill, one taken, one left. So if... And nobody knows the day or the hour. But the elect, and if he comes while we are still here on earth, then we will be gathered together with him. We will be removed. And I'm not really interested in a label of it because it just serves for contention. But you can't deny what is written. I mean, I can't. I don't mean to put that off on you all. But I can't read this word 
and just ignore the fact that two are sleeping in the bed, one is taken and one left. Two are grinding at the mill, one is taken and one left. I don't even know if that will be in my lifetime. I'm not even concerned about it. We're to occupy until he comes. We're busy. We have a lot of work to do right now because we have a lot of brothers and sisters that we haven't even met yet to do all we can to lead them in love to Jesus to introduce us or to introduce him to them. So anyway, the elect are taken and the others are left. And I feel very sorry for those that are left. I have a heart for them. And God does as well. And you guys do too. So the elect, we can look at the, the elect real quick before I get off air here. The elect are actually chosen by God. They're picked out. They're favored. They represent excellence. They're, this word elect is actually um, applied to a certain group of individuals who are Christians. So the very elect would be chosen out of the elect. And so you have a group of Christians that are elect, and then you have the very elect, which are certain individuals. I don't really understand all the ins and outs. I'm really careful to read more into the word than what's been revealed to me. So I don't like to elaborate on things that I haven't been shown the fullness of it myself. And But you guys can search this out yourself, and then you can teach me because um, that's what we're here for. But um, the elect has obtained salvation through Jesus, and that is accomplished through faith. He is the author and the finisher of our faith, and we are in that stance right now. That's where we are right now. And so the elect are disciples. It's who God chooses, who he deems fit to receive his favor to be separated from mankind, to be his own. These ones that are elect here and are disciples, they are tended to continually by his gracious oversight is how it's written in the word. So they're attended to all the time. I don't know if you guys remember, but sometimes Jesus would speak to the masses and then he would move through the crowds And he would gather the disciples around him and take them into a separate area. And he would teach them individually. That is what it means to be a part of this elect. He's teaching you individually and on a daily basis. Like you're never apart from him. Um, Let me see. There's a question. Okay. Is the elect the same as the remnant? Well, I don't know, Kimmy, once you find out. <laughs> That's a really good question. Maybe the very elect is the remnant, hmm, she says. You know, that's a really good question. And so um, you can you can do a, Larry, do it yourself. No, I, it was muted. No, it wasn't muted. Oh, my goodness. Oh, they couldn't hear you, so they probably think, okay, you guys, Larry burped really loud in my ear. He did. It was so loud, and I thought you all heard it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my oh, word. Sorry. That's okay. So, Kimmy, if it just came up. That's okay. That's okay, Larry. I'm glad they didn't all hear it. Um. So, anyway. <laughs> Now they're now new kitties laughing. So, Kimmy, if you don't mind to assume that assignment to do a word study on the remnant in in the Greek and see where that takes you, and um, we'll match up. Maybe my we can even go on air. I know you'll be on air with Larry doing the news this week, but maybe we can go on air together. And we can match it up, the elect to the um, remnant, because that's an awesome question. Let's see. Um, Other things uh, about uh, 
She said her homework. Yep, you got homework. Thank you. And we'll all be blessed from it. And I think you will be as well. But um, so the elect also are set apart from the religious multitude. So they not only understand scripturally what's written in the they do spiritually as well. So they don't only have the understanding and the religious mindset, they understand the spiritual side of things as well. They don't live by the law. They fulfill the law. They understand that Jesus fulfilled the law. So he was a doer of the word and not just a speaker of the word. And we're called to do the same thing. Um, these are also also those he affirms over, he maintains them, he teaches them, he exhorts them in due time, he advises them, commands them, he directs them, he calls each one of them by name, he speaks of them, and they're also reserved for him alone. They're citizens of his kingdom. And so it is, like Tatum said in chat, it is that intimate relationship. It's that one-on-one, that exchange back and forth. It's alive. It's breathing. It's an intimacy that no one else can fulfill. But the beautiful thing about being chosen is you no longer seek anything or anyone to fulfill that void. So some of us are there and some of us, are in that process right now. And once you reach that, then you'll know it because you really do not seek fulfillment. You don't worship anything or anyone else. And what I mean by worship, you don't do all that you can to be pleasing in the sight of anything or anyone other than Jesus. So he says, many are called, few are chosen. The chosen chase after Jesus. The many chase after the lust of their of their flesh for fulfillment to be complete. And so, this isn't a condemnation thing. This is an awareness. We're we're gaining spiritual awareness of ourselves. Where are we? Who do we say you are, Lord? That's what I titled Michael's. Um, talk from last night who who do we say you are well he's at he knows who he is he's asking that question because he wants us to define who we say he is he knows who he says we are (laughs) but do we know and so who do we say he is in our life is he our everything our all in all um Do we seek him or are we seeking what he can do for us? This is, this is just important for our walk with him. And it doesn't matter who other people are saying he is like, that's not even an issue right now on the table. Like we really don't need to be concerned so much about that. And sometimes I feel like that people that are so very concerned about how everyone else is doing in their walk, they are trying to avoid the perfection of their own walk with the Lord. Because we need to be first and foremost right now in this season of being prepared as a bride to marry our bridegroom. Well, when a bride is planning her own wedding, she's not even planning anyone else's wedding. She doesn't even have time for that. So what are we doing? Some people sit back and chat. And I just want you all to know, don't change what you're doing. I'm not, I'm not saying this for any other reason than just to make us aware internally But some people sit back and chat just simply to judge what's being written in chat. (laughs) They feel like they have been appointed 
to judge what is being put in chat. And they will often come in like, oh, those poor souls. I would never post that. Well, everything is off there. That's off. That is not at all what we're called to do, ever. Not at all. That's wearing a cloak of godliness, but it's not being godly. Because we lead by example. That's how Michael talked about the elders, right, last night too? That's what an elder does. An elder leads by example. So an elder, a true elder in the church, would get into chat. They would get in there. That's what Jesus did. He went to the sinners. A true elder would get into chat and demonstrate what godliness is. They wouldn't sit back and judge what is posted in chat and have, which is having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. I don't know about you all, but I don't seek to have a form of godliness. I want to abide in him. So I display him as a sweet, saving, savor, aroma everywhere I go. I don't know if that makes sense. Are you all with me? I know for a fact people do this. I know for a fact. I'm not going to tell you who or how I know or when they're doing it, but they do. So who is the least in the kingdom? Is it the judgers or the sinner? You know, I've asked myself this for a long time. Who would be, who would Jesus be close to? Would he be closest to the sinner or the judger judging the sinner? Because the woman at the well, he gave her water, and I taught this yesterday in our women's small group. The reason he poured himself as a drink offering into the woman at the well, he says it two times, and I had missed it until I was preparing for my teaching yesterday, is because she spoke honestly to him. She didn't deny the fact that she had had many husbands. She confessed it. But those that judge the one that's had many husbands, Jesus is not close to. I don't know. It's just a life lesson. It's, it's, a, it's something good to think about for our perfection. Are we trying to perfect others or are we letting him perfect us? These are all questions I ask myself. Am I trying to perfect another in order to possibly not let him perfect me because I have some painful hurt there that I don't want exposed or maybe I have some sin there that I don't want to confess? I mean, I've often shared with you all that the point is not the fact that that I married someone that maybe was abusive and committed adultery. The point was is that I, out of rebellion, married the wrong person. Did it give me justification in the sight of the Lord for when he left to let him leave? Yes. But I'm not seeking to be right here. I'm seeking Jesus. I don't care about being right. I care about being pleasing in his eyes. And because of that, then I repent for my hand in the deed that went wrong. It's never okay to cheat on a spouse. It's never okay to be physically aggressive with your spouse. Never. But does that excuse my sin in the deed? No. Didn't excuse what I'd done. You know, I'm just sharing what he has taught me. I can only speak of the things that I've learned, you know. And so if we're going to look for sin in the other people around us, we're always going to find it. But can we deliver them from sin? No. But if we're always checking for sin within us, can we be delivered from it? 
Yes. And how? Through Jesus. So is it better to look at the sin of another? Or is it better to go ahead and let us be fully exposed so that we can be delivered of the sin? Well, I think since he's perfecting us right now in our walk, and Pastor Betty wants me to do a broadcast um, from now on on Wednesdays. Tatis is going to come on on Thursdays. And so my whole topic, what I'm going to teach on on Thursday, or on, excuse me, that's her, <laughs> is um, on Wednesday is be therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so I'm kind of, I guess, I didn't plan on this at all. I was going to ask you guys what you want me to talk about. I guess I'm laying a groundwork for this perfection, for him perfecting us. And so it's just, it grieves my heart because oftentimes when a sin is revealed, we want to lash out at the one that revealed the sin in us. When chances are, if the Lord is really, and we believe what he wrote, if he really is the author and finisher of, at least the word says faith, but of our lives, let's just say of our lives, if we've handed our lives over to him and we're letting him finish us, because that's what that scripture means. It's a finishing it's as perfected when he finally appears in the sky, then are we really going to lash out at those that the Lord has placed into our lives to let the sin be exposed? And then once it's exposed and the test comes, what are we going to do with that? Are we going to repent of it? Or are we going to just keep trying to cover it and that wears the person out? Because what I know in all those years after my husband left, well, not years, but, well, three years, you know, a few months, and I'm still at work here. But um, what happened with me is I had a root of bitterness and I cloaked it in victimization cloaking, I wore a covering, I wore a garment of being a victim, poor me, look what happened to me, well, when you wear that garment of victimization, then you're denying the work that the Father is allowing to be done in your life to perfect you for the end of the race, I'm going to say that again, because you're not a victim You're being perfected as a saint of the Most High God. He's purging us right now. And so if you tell yourself of a victim, you cannot be drinking of the life of everlasting. The woman at the well didn't come to Jesus and say, all these men beguiled me. So I slept with them, and I'm calling them husband, and they're not even my husband. She just admitted it. And until you let the Lord uncover that wound and reveal it, it can't be healed. If you step into a marriage through adultery or through... Um, self-will like I did and denied every red flag there was. And if you're not right now reaping what you've sown, there is no better time than today to go to the Father and thank Him that He's revealing this truth to you today. If you've sown anger into a relationship with a brother or sister, and you're now reaping anger, there is no greater time than today, this very, very moment, to go to that brother or that sister and say, hey, anger has crept up between us. 
and where only love should remain? How do you and I cross that bridge in love and reconcile? Because Jesus is all about reconciliation. Everything he did was to reconcile us to the Father. Well, we're to be reconciled one to another. I need to find this scripture. There's a scripture that talks about don't take your sacrifice to the throne. Well, it doesn't say the throne to the altar, but technically it is. I got to find that. Because the Lord's laying that on my heart. That we are to put, put away these childish ways. Get rid of these childish ways. Because he's actually maturing us right now. I can't find that scripture. Someone can find it for me. Um, it talks about how we, that we need to, before we go to the throne, to the altar, if we have something against another, to not do anything else first, but go back and reconcile with that brother or that sister, the brethren in there. And um, that's just really important what he's laying upon my heart right now. And I, oh, thank you, lovey-dovey. It's Matthew 524, she said. Let me go there real quick. Thank you for finding that for me. It's like I get the scripture, but I have no idea where it is. Okay, it says, therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar... And there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee. So anyway, all these, all those these and those. It says if you, you have something that you want to offer up to the Lord, but in the back of your mind, you're still remembering something that a brother has done to bring harm to you. He says, leave your gift before you get to the altar. Leave it. Just set it down and go your way first to be reconciled to your brother and then come back, pick up your gift, pick up that that you want to offer to me. Jesus is saying, pick it up and then offer it. That's, it's so simple that a child can do it. It is so very simple, but who will do it? Who will do it? It says, agree with your adversary quickly. So if you have someone that, you're just, I know you don't have peace because most of you walk in love. You can't help it. You have the can't help it for love. And I know that it bothers you all the time if you have someone that you feel is in opposition to you. I know that you, that's how you are because I know you all. I know your hearts, how they're turned towards the Lord. You may deny it. You may be like, oh, I, it don't bother me. I'm fine. But I know at night in the quiet times, or I know when you're doing dishes or when you're mowing the lawn, I know that it comes to you occasionally that you are in opposition with someone. And the Lord put that in you for this reason right here. And it says, agree with your adversary quickly to do it quickly while you're in the way with them. Because it tells us right here in the scripture what happens, happens when you don't. If you don't, at any time, the adversary will deliver you to the judge. And then to the officer, and then you'll be put into a prison. So if you don't go back and mend the fences, as they say, just mend them. And I think Larry said Friday night when I was on with him and Moxie, he said, people, that doesn't mean that you have to let them into your inner circle to betray you again. But you need to be at peace with all people, with all brethren. Just be at peace with them. And that means that it happened. And then move on. It's okay. It's kind of like kids that get angry in a, a game say they're playing dodgeball and one throws the ball and hits one in the head. Well, what's the PE teacher? He brings both parties. He's the mediator. And he says, you know what? It happened. 
Maybe he meant to do it and he was angry. Maybe he did it unintentionally. But you both, you need to reconcile here. And let's finish the game. That's what the Lord is calling us to do now. And who can do it? And the other thing is that other person, they may not be where you are spiritually in their walk. And they may deny it. They may say, no, I'm mad. I don't care. I'm mad. And that's when you forgive, release, and bless. And it's okay. But by doing that, you won't be cast into prison. It doesn't say that they're going to be cast into prison. It says you will be. And prison here is bondage. You won't be, you won't be free. Who the Lord sets free is free indeed. You're going to, he won't let you go, okay? He's not, Jesus is not going to let you go until you reconcile. So you have peace. And so you're really doing it for yourself. Even more so. So, anyway, that's just kind of a little nugget there, if you will. It definitely sets the premise for Wednesday on what we're going to talk about. Because we're going to talk about praying, being accounted worthy, to escape these things. We're going to talk about standing before the Son of Man. We're going to talk about having love for one another above all things because love covers a multitude of sin. And it covers our sin. Any acts of love do not go unnoticed by the Lord. So when you release someone that has harmed you and hurt you by betrayal some way, When you release them, a sin you've committed against another is covered. And that's what we're going to get clear understanding on. I know you might be saying, oh, how can that be? That just can't be. I can't really wrap my mind around it. Well, I'll, I'll paint that picture for you, how that works. So loving someone is not covering their sin. We don't keep darkness hid. But when we love someone and we give an action towards them, love's an action word, it's not just spoken, it's action, it's moving, it's alive, then because they don't deserve it, we love them anyway, then we get covered and we no longer walk in shame but in freedom. That's how our sin is covered. And it's all done through the blood of the Lamb, through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you all, but I need my sin (laughs) covered because we're going to talk about that perfection. Now, it says in the word not to let man judge you and what you eat or drink. Well, perfection in the Lord's eyes has nothing to do with what you eat or drink. That's not what he's talking about here. Completeness in Jesus is perfection, and that's the path that we're all on right now. We're on that threshold. So that's just kind of a teaser of what we're going to talk about Wednesday. A lovey-dovey said what time? Um, I think Pastor Bubby said 930 Central, that's my time. 9.30 Central Time. 10.30 Eastern. Yep, 10.30 Eastern Time. And Tatum is going to have a Voice of Grace show Thursday, too. Yeah, Thursday. Mm -hmm. So good, we'll be back to back. You'll be fed two days in a row there. (laughs) Wednesday and Thursday at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh Uh-huh, and then Michael will do Enoch on Friday morning. And I think Brother Vernon normally does Monday. And who knows, maybe someone, like it was just led on, on, I was just led this morning to come on and talk with you all for just a little bit as a family this morning. So, you know, that could happen again Tuesday. Pastor Bubby told me anytime the Lord lays the Holy, or through the Holy Spirit lays it on me to just share what I've been studying throughout the morning, just to let him know. 
and Larry, he also is good about letting me come on. And um, so maybe Tuesday we'll even be able to have a broadcast. That's up to the Lord. But um, we started our Handmaidens Beauty for Ashes women's group yesterday. And um, just since I'm on air and I have some of you all with me, it's just amazing how the Lord handpicked these handmaidens for this. And uh, so don't feel like you missed out if it's a heart's desire for you as um, a handmaiden to the Lord to get, it's all about a closer intimacy with Jesus and that putting him first in our lives. That is the totality of this study. One thing I do know about this study that the Lord gave me through the vision for it is you have to be broken and in humility and ready to place him first in your life to go through it. This study is for the broken, those that are hurt, hurting right now, that need wounds exposed so that he can heal them. And um, right now we're undressing <laughs> before him. That's a good way to describe it. We're disrobing so that he can give us a garment of praise because we've been trying to put an old garment on over a dirty dress. And so in this study, the way I see it is will be 12 weeks and then we'll do it again. We have a waiting list already. And if it really needs to be between eight and 10 ladies, I call him, I call them the beauties. They're beautiful. They're my beauties here. Um, once we hit the waiting list hits 10, I can start another one. I could have two going at the same time because we're going to be doing, um, it's not easy being a woman, the Esther study through Beth Moore. And if you can't afford a workbook, we'll make sure and order one for you. But we haven't even started that yet because right now we're removing our old garment so that he can dress us in the new garment. And that will be done through the Esther study. <laughs> Okie dokie. He said, I'm not even going to apply. Nope, you can't apply. It's for women only. <laughs> women only. So the only requirement for this is to really want a closer intimate relationship with Jesus and to be a pla in a place of humility and to have Skype because that's the only way I know to do it. And so I was really frustrated there for a little bit about the Skype thing. And then the Lord told me if they want me bad enough, they'll overcome their fear of Skype and get Skype. And so I'm not chasing anyone down to do this. I'm really not. I, I think that if you need this intimate time with the Lord, he'll draw you to it. And I love our group right now. I really do. It also requires um, a, like a um, dedication to just loyalty that what stays in there does not go any further. And I've been teaching about handmaidens, what it's like to be a handmaiden to one another. So I've kind of paired them off in twos right now because the Lord sent people out two by two. So I've appointed them bride and maid of honor and would be a better way to describe it, but bride and ha handmaiden. And they are to be 100% exposed to one another. Confidential, like Moxie said. And once you create that element of trust where Jesus is in the center, it's a three chord strand of love. Then once you begin to share in openness and be vulnerable, they will too. And then you're held to that loyalty because vulnerability will only increase vulnerability. And so if I know something about you, I hold that precious, you know, something about me, I hold, you hold that precious, and then we're very sensitive to the fact that it should not go any further. 
But in this element, judges need not apply because this has nothing to do with judging where the other person is at. This is all about exposing where we are so the Lord can finish our faith and our walk. All right. So um, I think that should do it. I don't know if Michael will be on today. I have no idea. I haven't heard from him. And I know you guys sometimes wonder that. And so if I hear anything, I'll let you know. But I've kind of just learned to go with the flow. Really, I'm blessed if he's on and I'm blessed if he's not anymore. (laughs) I'm kind of in a different place now. And um, so you guys need to be as well. Go to the Lord directly. Everything else, whether I'm talking, Michael, someone else, it's all just a blessing. It's the icing on the cake of Jesus. (laughs) So, all right, I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity this morning. Lord, I thank you that you are calling us right now. And Lord, we humbly submit to you so that you choose us to be your disciples, to be the salt and the light, to be your hands and feet upon this earth. Lord, I thank you that you are teaching us what it means to walk in mature love. That that fleshly love we've tried, Father, and we repent of that because it doesn't work. It doesn't fulfill that void. And Lord, we thank you that you even created that void within us so we would seek you one and only, that you are our first and everlasting love. You're bringing us back into the fold right now, and it's precious, Lord. Well, we're so full of humility and humbleness. We're not worthy, although you have found us worthy. And we, we just devote our entire being to you, Lord, in spirit, soul, and body. We thank you that you have reconciled us to the Father. So because of that, Lord, we seek more of you. We can't seem to get enough of you. We're very thirsty for your everlasting water. We're very hungry for your word as it's written, and we want the fullness of it. So like I said, Father, we just, We thank you that you are watching over your word within us to perform us. That's what you're actually doing. You are performing us. So we're not really quite used to, Father. We're just not quite used to being served by you like this because we're so used to being servants and serving others. And bear with us, Lord. Thank you for your patience because... I, it's really hard to receive at times. And what I mean by that is we get into this mode of we have to do and do and do. But this short season that we're in, Lord, we're learning how to receive and receive and receive. And it's all purposeful. I recognize that, Father, it's purposeful so that as we're perfected, that we can pour out just as Jesus did. But, Lord, help us to receive. Help us to be humble and to not be prideful as you're teaching us this new aspect of our calling in you. Help us to understand with clarity the work that you're doing. We're going to receive from you, Lord. So I just seal up all the words that I spoke in the blood of Jesus. May they bless you today. May you get more clarity on what I spoke. And I just pray that, and I bind those words up in your heart in the name of Jesus, where the enemy cannot come in and steal these seeds. And the seeds that I spoke, Heavenly Father, I just come before you and ask you to water them and give the increase. You increase, Lord. Heavenly Father, make them grow, Lord, and exponential growth, Father, because there's people waiting on these these chosen vessels that I've spoken to today. Lord, they have tons of people waiting on them. 
to come into the fruition of you. So if I may ask that of you, Father, Your Majesty, please give exponential quick growth. Lots of rain, lots of water, Lord. Okay. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I love you guys. And I think that'll do it for me. I really don't have anything else to share. I'm just going to keep praying on this word that I'm going to deliver for Wednesday. And um, love you all. Have a blessed day. And be joyful today. Be joyful. Don't let the enemy steal those seeds of joy because they're in you. And he's going to try, but you don't let him. You just resist that. Larry's going to play some more music, and we'll just worship for a little bit. Love you all.